Uh, so I'm going to start by assuming that most people in the room are familiar with the uh, simplest model of a uh, glacier length response to climate um, in which the length fluctuations are linearized around some mean state and climate fluctuations C cause an immediate tendency on the length change and for that reason I'm going to call all such models one stage models uh, and there's a time scale a tau on which the glacier relaxes back to equilibrium representing its response time or its memory. Uh, it was developed by Thomas Johansson, Charlie Raymond, and Ed Waddington, popularized by Johannes Erlemans, um, and of course it's linear, so it can be inverted for climate history. Um, it's got nice analytical solutions, so it's a textbook toy model to learn from. Um, it's been calibrated to observations to estimate glacier sensitivity to climate. Uh, it's been applied to reconstruct global temperature histories from glacier histories. Um, it's been used to downscale climate projections to make uh, sea level projections. Uh, and it's also been used to estimate uh, the magnitude of glacier fluctuations that you expect just due to random fluctuations year to year in weather. Uh, one advantage is that the climate can be specified very flexibly, so the climate fluctuations uh, can be specified either in terms of uh, temperature, melt season temperature, T, uh, accumulation, P. Uh, you can drive it with annual mass balance fluctuations or seasonal mass balance fluctuations or even variations in the ELA. And the point is that the alpha, beta, gamma coefficients are all simple functions of the glacier geometry and so um, estimatable from observations. Uh, this timescale tau um, appears in some uh, important analytical solutions. So the sensitivity of the glacier to a change in melt season temperature, delta T or accumulation delta P, uh, the trend in the glacier length in response to trends in temperature or precipitation, and the variance of the glacier fluctuations in response to uh, random variations in temperature and precipitation are all proportional to this time scale tau. So uh, tau is obviously an important number that you want to know. Um, Johannesson et al. Uh, originally argued that that time scale should be uh, represented as the ratio of the mean glacier thickness to the terminus mass balance rate. H over B dot is a well-known relationship. Um, that's often criticized as being too short, and uh, I want to make the point that it, uh, actually it's completely correct and, and, and very fundamental. Okay, so my, my approach is to uh, take uh, this one-stage model and compare its performance to a numerical flow line model that includes ice deformation and sliding. Here it's just shallow ice plus sliding. Uh, and I'm going to choose parameters that are typical for small alpine glaciers that we have in the Pacific Northwest. So first off, here are those two models' responses to step changes uh, of plus or minus 0.5 meters per year in accumulation. The numerical flow line model is the green line. The one stage model is the black line. Uh, after about 30 years or so, they have both essentially ended up in the same place, an advance or a retreat of about uh, 600 meters on a background length of about eight kilometers. But the way they get to that same ultimate equilibrium is very different. The one stage model, as it must, approaches that equilibrium asymptotically. On the other hand, the numerical flow line model is uh, more tulip shaped. It takes a while to get going um, uh, before it uh, increases slightly more uh, quickly and, and, and then ends up roughly in the same place. Here's those two models' uh, response to synthetic climate time series, which are just uh, random white noise with an amplitude which is consistent with uh, instrumental observations. The numerical flow line model is the green line again, and over 500 years, it has fluctuations with an amplitude of about a kilometer or so. Uh, the point here that I want to make is that one stage model uh, looks okay. There's too much high frequency variability. Um, that can be reinforced by looking at a plot of the autocorrelation of these uh, glacier responses uh, on the left and the power spectrum on the right. Um, first, the autocorrelation. You can see that the one-stage model forgets its initial conditions too quickly relative to the numerical flow line model. The numerical flow line model hangs around remembering its previous states for longer than the one-stage model. Um, it's the same information on the spectrum. This is log frequency, log power. So we've got 10, 100, 1,000 years. Um, the low frequency behavior is very, very good. They agree very well. Um, but consistent with that time series, there's just too much high frequency variability in that one stage model. Um, so first question, I want to say, is this tau the right time scale? 
And I'm going to ask that question by um, looking at the response of three different sized glaciers. And I do this here just simply by changing the uh, basal slope that I'm assuming. This is about an eight kilometer long glacier, 1630. And again, this is the response to stochastic um, synthetic climate time series. Here's the autocorrelation plots for those uh, three glaciers. And uh, not surprisingly, the bigger glacier has a longer response time. The smaller glacier has the smallest response time. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is now normalize this time axis by the tau appropriate to each of those glaciers. They've each got an individual thickness, an individual mass balance terminus rate, and uh, I can just divide time by the tau for each glacier. And what you see is they all collapse onto the same curve. This could not work if tau was not the fundamental underlying time scale for these glaciers. Um, so it demonstrates there really is only one time scale, but the key is it's not an exponential behavior. It's this sigmoidal or tulip-shaped behavior um, that the, uh, the glaciers are operating under. And you can kind of argue, hand wave, that this behavior is uh, a consequence of scale invariance. The glaciers all look the same, so that the shape of their time evolution must also be the same. Uh, so what's going on at high frequencies? Um, can I click on the screen somehow? Get oh, that's not good. Well, upside down, okay. So this is an animation of the thickness profile for the glacier in response to an increase in accumulation. And the, um, the lines come on every one tau's worth of time elapsing. And the point I want to make is uh, that the interior thickness approaches equilibrium much faster than the length approaches equilibrium. So within just one tau, we're pretty much all the way to equilibrium, whereas the length takes uh, a longer time to, uh, to get there. And this is another way of looking at the same thing. Um, as a function of, of t over tau, this is the, uh, the shapes of the thickness, terminus flux, and glacier length as a fraction of their new equilibrium values. I just want to make the point that the thickness changes first followed by the terminus flux, followed by the glacier length. So there are three overlapping stages in the adjustment of the glacier um, to a climate change. Um, this behavior is, is consistent with a linearization of um, shallow ice approximation, where the diffusivity is much larger in the interior of the ice sheet. So things are mixed much more efficiently in the glacier interior than they are near the terminus. So we can visualize this then as a sequence of three overlapping stages, and we can represent those three stages by a chain of three equations. So fluctuations in mass balance drive changes in thickness, fluctuations in thickness drive changes in the flux, and finally, fluctuations in the flux drive changes in the length. And uh, for simplicity, we can assign an equal time scale to uh, each of these three stages. Uh, eliminate two of the variables and you're left with a single third order equation for fluctuations in length. Importantly, it's still linear, so it's still invertible. Um, you can discretize the equation uh, in time and uh, it has this form. This is the form of what's known as an autoregressive moving average model uh, in which the state at time t depends on the state at previous time steps in the integration and uh, climate fluctuations at some previous time. Uh, this form of equation is beloved by statisticians, and the great advantage of that is there are textbook solutions for the shape of the spectrum, the autocorrelation function, uh, all of the useful metrics that you want, um, and it's also uh, implementable on a single, uh, single line uh, on the command line in MATLAB. So how well does it do? This is the previous um, plot I showed you of the response to a step function, the numerical flow line and the one-stage model. That's the behavior of the three-stage model. And you can see it's, it's nailing this, this uh, sigmoidal, tulip-shaped approach to equilibrium very well. Um, do the same thing for the stochastic uh, fluctuations, and it nails it cold. We can look at the um, autocorrelation, the power spectrum, and the phase of these now three models. Um, and the, uh, the autocorrelation is, is very well emulated by this linear three-stage model. The power spectrum um, is emulated up until uh, the power is, is so low. This is, this is grid resolution issues. Um, 
Something that is, uh, I think, perhaps most significant is that the phase relationship, so the lead or lag with respect to the forcing, is also very well emulated by this three-stage model. Um, and the clue that three stages is the right number of stages is that at high frequencies, you tend to a phase lag of about 270 degrees. So each stage is in, at high frequencies, is in quadrature with the previous stage. So you get three times 90, which is 270. Um, and that's the behavior of both the flow line numerical model and, of course, the, the three-stage model by construction. Um, the three-stage model also does comparably well for those other uh, larger glaciers as well. Okay, so we, we have some analytical solutions. Um, uh, the sensitivity of the length to step changes in climate. Um, and, and to climate trends, and also the variance that you expect given random year to year fluctuations in weather. Um, an important concept is um, the idea of a signal to noise ratio, which is simply the, the ratio of the, the change that you expect in the glacier length um, driven by a climate change relative to the size of the standard deviation that you get just due to the, uh, the noise, the random year to year weather, weather fluctuations. Um, Using this three-stage model, we can see what we expect for those dependencies. So if we, if we want a good detector of climate, we want a high signal-to-noise ratio. So we want a large tau, which is associated with larger glaciers, and we'd like uh, temperature not to be um, uh, subsumed by a lot of, um, let's say, accumulation variability. So we'd be looking towards continental glaciers where you expect less accumulation variability. Um, we can see the relative importance of those parameters in a relationship like this. Uh, here's an example of, of applying that idea. This is 500 years of, uh, again, synthetic climate time series. Um, this, the, the blue line is just one realization. The shading is the one, two, and three sigma uh, bounds that you expect. Um, and here are our glacier fluctuations. I can impose a uh, one degree warming over the final 100 years, which is about what we've seen from anthropogenic climate change. And this is what you expect the glacier response to be. In this particular case, the signal-to-noise ratio is about two. Um, what that means is, very roughly, um, you should expect past fluctuations of glaciers which are comparable to the modern retreats that we've seen over the 20th century. Um, and importantly, this doesn't require any climate change to get those retreats. Um, I'm on yellow already, so I'm going to whip through this quite quickly. Um, the three-stage model can be adapted to an arbitrary geometry, and so this is a case study of applying it to a uh, Nygut's brand. Um, I'm not going to show that. This is uh, the time series of the numerical model. That's how well the three-stage model does. Um, it, there's a slope break, so the linear model can't capture um, the damped advances of the uh, numerical model. Um, but let me just stop. So, um, one stage models can capture the equilibrium changes, but not the transient behavior. This tau, that is the right time scale. Don't care what anyone else says. Uh, glacier adjustment happens in three overlapping stages, thickening, flux increases, then terminus advances. You can represent them as a chain of three equations. Um, and then one needs to account for this issue of signal to noise when uh, interpreting past climates. And I'll just finish with this, of course, which is um, the result of those historical reconstructions of, of Nygaard's brain, um, and I'll just make the point that we need to be careful about how we interpret uh, the climate history that gave rise to these kind of fluctuations on the landscape if we're going to have a, a clear understanding of what that climate history was. Thank you. Questions for Jared? For that is the um, you need to make sure that uh, the spatial scales of the of, of the climate variability are smaller than the glaciers you are adding into your pot of information because all the glaciers in in Scandinavia will do roughly the same thing because a wet year there is a wet year everywhere glaciers in Scandinavia in the Alps no that's a larger scale than you expect to be coherent in the climate change so that is independent information. Um, but that's, that's the key, is, is what's the scale of the coherence in 
the patterns of climate variability. So it was beginning to break down for Nygaard's brand because of that slope break. So there's no symmetry between advances where you've got to build a great big thick tongue versus retreats where you, it, it, it's, uh, it's changed substantially. So no linear model is going to be able to replicate that behavior. So those are the kinds of things that you need to be aware of. Um, yeah. 